Very good, thank you. For those of you who are awake, you can probably identify that I'm really not Aya, uh, uh, who's listed ahead of me on the program, but we decided to uh, reverse the order. So I'm uh, talking um, about population, about population quantity, the numerical side of population, population quality, including health, education, nutrition, and mobility uh, related to both. Uh, and I'm going to start by giving a very brief uh, description of the demographic transition uh, because um, that helps give some perspective on this topic um, about where we've been and where we're likely to go uh, and helps to uh, tie together certain dimensions of population uh, quantity uh, and quality. So the If I hold the clicker right side up, it helps a lot, I've learned. I'm, I'm not so quick on technology. So the demographic transition is basically a change uh, that the world has experienced to various degrees from initially areas of very high fertility and very high mortality and therefore low life expectancy to situations where fertility is much lower and mortality uh, uh, much lower as well, and higher life expectancy. Uh, so that uh, combination results in very substantial changes in society. Uh, it's brought about in part by the economy and it affects in important ways the economy. Uh, as you can see, there are lines on this diagram for various countries. Uh, here's the European experience. Uh, here's the, the least developing countries. Uh, all these lines are downward sloping. Uh, this has implications that are uh, important. Uh, one implication is that uh, generally uh, these populations are aging as we go through the demographic transition. A second important implication is that in the process of the uh, demographic transition, uh, there typically is a substantial reduction in the dependency ratio, where the dependency ratio is the number of people too young or too old or disabled to work relative uh, to the size of the workforce. That opens up the opportunity for what is sometimes called a demographic bonus uh, which estimates suggest played an important role in some of the uh, East Asian uh, uh, very high development efforts. Uh, now here's the world population, and it's you know it's it's amazing, it's striking uh, what has happened in in recent uh, years in terms of the world population. We around 1950 the world population was two and a half billion. Uh, around uh, 2010, uh, over 7 billion, almost tripled, a huge increase. And here's projections from the UN Population Division of what will happen now using the median proje uh, projection is uh, uh, referred to as most probable uh, with an increase from 7, roughly 7 billion plus now to 10 billion uh, in 2100. That's a big increase, it may be a little more than that, it may be less than that, but it's small compared with the increase which was experienced the last half of the uh, 20th century. These are the population growth rates which are associated with uh, those patterns. Pretty low, around uh, uh, half per percent for centuries, literally went up um, amazingly up to over 2% in around 1970 and since it plummeted uh, substantially and projected to continue uh, depending on which projection uh, you look at uh, to go down in the future. You know, big question is, uh, first an, an amazing part of this experience in a way, there's this huge increase in population. Uh, Per, median per capita income in the world at the same time increased by 150 percent. Life expectancy increased by 33 uh, percent. A number of positive things happened 
despite this huge uh, increase in population. Uh, and these are the sorts of uh, factors that uh, uh, demographers have tended to emphasize as important in explaining what happens. Part of it are market, and I should say market and institutional responses. Uh, if uh, something becomes scarce, substituting away from it. Uh, likewise, innovation has been attracted where there are scarcities. But also globalization and urbanization are thought to have integrated uh, markets in ways which have led to greater productivity. And then uh, on the more strictly demographic side, there's been an induced decline in fertility, probably associated strongly with increased uh, female education uh, and uh, increased investments in, in children in the sense of child quality of their education, their health and nutrition also probably very related to the expansion in uh, female education. So this is just referring to one of those dimensions. Uh, you know, what happened uh, in terms of food prices over that period of time, or what happened in terms of food prices more generally over the 21st century into to now. Now, here's the world population you're going up and then just really accelerating and starting to level off up here. Tremendous increase. Uh, on the other hand, in sharp contrast, real world agricultural prices, I said food, but it's really agriculture. Real world, uh, real world agricultural prices decline secondly by about a percent per year uh, through that century. Um, there was a lot of accommodation in terms of, of price responses in terms of new technologies uh, with uh, result that despite the huge population increase, the secular trend in uh, uh, agricultural prices was downward. Two comments merit. One is this increase here. There's lots of fluctuations in these prices. One big fluctuation occurred uh, in the period up to about 2009-2008 when there was lots of alarm about increasing food prices. Uh, since then, that's, uh, they have, uh, uh, agricultural prices have again declined back towards the secular trend. But despite this, you know, from the perspective of a century, this little blip, uh, the secular trend has been strongly downwards. Uh, second point uh, uh, is that uh, often it is suggested that high food prices really hit the poor. And I think that is very true, primarily for the urban poor. But for most uh, developing countries, there are larger shares of the poor in rural areas. And when agricultural prices go up, including food prices, it generates demand for labor and for their products. So it's not so clear that if one's interested in the poor, one's interested and having low agricultural prices, uh, because those will hit negatively, directly, uh, the poor and rural areas. The two kind of balance out. It's just kind of a question of which, which poor are going to be hit. So thinking about uh, population and the way the world varies, uh, we find it useful to distinguish between various stages in the demographic uh, translation. Uh, transition, there's still some high fertility, high population growth areas, much of which is in sub-Saharan Africa, much of which also has fairly low uh, population quality. There are some areas which face the potential of a demographic uh, dividend, much of South Asia and of Latin America. And uh, the post-transition older population structure, much of East Asia and most OECD countries. And you know, what are the issues and the problems differ depending upon which of these contexts we're talking about. Education, first I'd just like to say education, if it means learning, occurs in many venues. It's not the same thing as schooling. Schooling is an important part of education, but it's not the only way we learn. Learning occurs over the life cycle. It occurs uh, before schooling, it occurs after schooling. However, most information we have is on formal schooling. Uh, second, uh, probably related to early childhood development. 
Uh, and schooling enrollment has uh, expanded very impressively uh, in recent years and is projected to uh, continue to expand. Um, schooling is very related to economic growth. Economic growth is related to poverty reduction. Uh, it may not be the only or the most effective way to reduce poverty, but it is certainly strongly associated with poverty uh, reduction. And here's some estimates from Yasa uh, in uh, Austria and Vienna, in Vienna and Austria, of different kinds of uh, simulations of different combinations of, of schooling and what they apply for economic growth. This is the most schooling intensive scenario uh, associated with high uh, schooling, I'm sorry, high economic growth. Also, uh, other simulations uh, the same group has done. Uh, these are four different scenarios about the education in, uh, uh, on a global level. The different colors represent different types uh, of schooling, including no schooling, and our you know, scenarios looking forward. And because of the associations between schooling and demographic outcomes, the so-called fast track scenario ends up not only with the composition of a more schooled world population, uh, but with a lesser world uh, population total uh, than do the other scenarios that I don't have time to uh, describe. I, I mentioned that uh, early child education has been increasing emphasis, I think, throughout the world on the importance of, of uh, early uh, child education. These are, uh, this is a summary of the impact uh, in a re recent uh, Lancet paper of the impact of uh, different types of early child education on cognitive skills in uh, uh, medium and low income countries. Uh, point three is a, a pretty substantial impact. Um, the population, as I said before, uh, is aging in this process because of the demographic transition. Uh, we all know that, you know, particularly for the more developed countries, uh, but this is also happening for the whole world. Uh, this red line is for the uh, uh, less and least developed countries, uh, where at this point uh, the proportion of the population over 60 is on the order of magnitude of 8 or 9 percent, uh, but uh, by the middle of the century is projected to be 20 percent, which uh, is you know, basically what is the case for the more developed countries now. So aging is uh, pervasive, universal, uh, just happening with some lag in parts of the world. Associated with, with uh, aging uh, is, but not exclusively with aging, is a change in the nature of the disease burden. Uh, this is an example of estimates of uh, causes of death uh, for the eight top uh, causes of death in 2010. These are the changes since 1990. Uh, the light blue purple ones are what you might call non-communicable diseases, the diseases that we used to think of as the diseases of development. The pinker ones are uh, infectious diseases what we used to think of as the traditional diseases of development, with the exception of HIV AIDS in the 1990 to 2010 period, uh, which increased very substantially, uh, the traditional diseases have reduced substantially in their relative importance, and the non-chronic diseases uh, have become much more important, uh, very much related to uh, what Lai Ming was talking about in the uh, uh, distribution uh, of resources relative to needs uh, with the changing composition of diseases. Urbanization, uh, the world has urbanized uh, a lot. Uh, as you probably know, uh, recently uh, uh, a little over half, of the, for the first time half of the world uh, lives in urban areas, a little over half now. Uh, big cities have increased substantially and projections are that this will continue uh, in, in the near future. Uh, the urban population, moreover, is going to be more and more concentrated 
uh, in Asia and in, in Africa. Uh, Asia and Africa are the two least urbanized re regions now, so not only do, in the case of Asia, they have a large population, in the case of Africa, large population growth, uh, but also uh, for a given population growth, they're urbanizing a lot, so uh, these will be the major uh, places where uh, urbanization will uh, continue to occur. International migration uh, is uh, emphasized a lot. Uh, this is the, this, the uh, stock in 2010. Uh, I guess a couple points. One point is that these numbers uh, are really much smaller than the numbers associated with internal migration. It's internal migration, which underlies uh, a major part of the urbanization, where the numbers are really large. And secondly, uh, while the more developed regions have more uh, migrants, immigrants, than the less developed regions, not so much less. There's a lot of uh, uh, international migration among the uh, less developed countries. It's not all poor to rich. Policy implications, uh, I'll spend the rest of my time uh, talking about. Uh, first, just mention some general concerns. Economists tend, uh, in thinking about uh, policy uh, implications, to focus on two policy uh, motives. The first one is, is efficiency. And the idea of efficiency is simply, if you have given resources, given technology, and merely by changing the distribution resources among producers uh, or maybe among consumers, you can increase output same resources, same technology, uh, that must be good in some sense. That uh, added ad, uh, output uh, uh, for nothing but shifting around, that's a good thing, increasing productivity. On the other hand, there's concern about distribution. Uh, and in terms of distribution, uh, some people are very concerned about inequality. I think it's a value judgment, you know, in terms of what one's uh, concerned about, but my personal interests are much more in the subject of this conference. That's poverty, people on the left end of the table, uh, uh, the distribution, uh, rather than how spread out the distribution is in the other direction. Uh, but poverty and inequality would be the primary concerns about distribution. Um, Second point, you know, trying to estimate the probable rates of returns of policies is very challenging. We had some discussion on that yesterday. Uh, third point, very much uh, related to a point that uh, uh, Lin Ju was making several times yesterday. You know, incentives and commitment schemes may be very essential to making policies uh, work. Now, I'm going to speak briefly of benefits to cost for various kinds of policies related to population quantity, quality, migration. And I have in mind this kind of a life cycle framework. And let's just consider uh, early in life there's big risks like inadequate food, infectious diseases, poor maternal health, uh, inadequate uh, uh, stimulation. And one might have various interventions that affect those, that affect uh, various measures of child development, which then cascade through the life cycle, uh, through preschool ages, through uh, school ages, through post-schooling ages, through adulthood, uh, through uh, old ages. Uh, and all those may be affected by either decisions of the families or by public inter interventions. And so the challenge is if we have some intervention which says, uh, which for example improves food intake of uh, small children, how will that cascade? Uh, what will the benefits be? And importantly, what will the costs be uh, over the life cycle? So there's several uh, components that uh, uh, I think we should mention when we're doing this. First, as illustrated in that figure, there may be multiple impacts over the life cycle of some intervention. Uh, for any particular impact, there may be challenges in, 
in uh, estimating what it is because uh, uh, unless one had a randomized controlled trial for every possible impact, which uh, is probably impossible logistically and ethically, uh, one has to make inferences from uh, ob observational or behavioral data, uh, and that poses challenges about uh, unobserved factors, about choices that uh, households would make. Uh, second point related again to this, uh, uh, these impacts in that figure going over the life cycle, um, we want to compare likes with likes, and since some of these impacts will occur in three years and some of them uh, in 40 years, say an impact upon a child's productivity, we have to adjust them into uh, the same time period for which discount rates are used. Uh, there was some reference yesterday to 3% uh, discount rates as uh, I believe advocated by or used by WHO. Uh, a 3% discount rate, if you have a benefit that's $1,000 uh, 40 years from now, its present discount value is about $300 uh, because uh, you could use the resources for something else over the next 40 years if you didn't use it for that uh, investment. Uh, if the discount rate is higher, you know, 6% would be about uh, $80, 10%, which is what is advocated often by international organizations for infrastructural projects, uh, it would be $22. So the discount rate makes a whole lot of difference in how you think about these. Uh, a further complication is that there's substitution between different interventions, say intervention for nutrition and intervention for, uh, for learning. Uh, they may interact either concurrently or over time. Uh, a fourth uh, complication because of the model multiple impacts is that you somehow need to add together the you know, value of additional year of schooling with a reduction in uh, uh, some chronic disease. Both of those may be impacts. It gets particularly complicated or uh, at least uh, controversial if uh, one of the impacts is averting mortality because it's a question of how you make that evaluation. Uh, a fifth point here for the impacts, but also down here for the cost, is these are likely to be very context dependent because they tend depend on the natures of the markets, the prices, the environments. Uh, you know, the, the value of a deworming program isn't going to be very great uh, if you don't have worms in the environment, for example. Uh, but equally important if you are trying to get the benefits versus the cost as the impacts are the resource costs. Uh, these include both public and private resource costs, although sometimes the private ones are ignored and usually they have negative impact because they're quite often in the areas in which I'm interested, born by poor rural women who have to spend time doing something or in, for, to make the intervention work. Um, the kind of said the second point, uh, there's also uh, some distortion costs from raising uh, resources for public funds which should be integrated. So first I'm going to look at uh, some benefit cost ratios uh, for population quantity uh, and uh, this is based on a lot of underlying uh, work that I can't summarize obviously in this presentation but uh, uh, in this work, we come up with some uh, really high benefit cost ratios uh, for some possibilities. Uh, first, for uh, achieving universal access to sexual and reproductive health services by 2030 and eliminating unmet need for modern contraception by 2040, uh, we get benefit to cost ratios over, uh, over 90. You know, you get over $90 for every dollar you spend. Uh, sounds to me like a good deal. I would like to have an account where I could get $90 back for every dollar I put into it. Uh, secondly, uh, reducing barriers to international or to migration both within countries, but also between low and middle income countries. Uh, the 
benefit cost ratio we get is still very high. It's half as high as the other, but it's very high. Uh, with you know, some costs, but with the cost to the recipient countries uh, being much less than the uh, political debate might suggest. Uh, some uh, publishing quantity uh, policies with uh, probably high benefit cost ratios, but very difficult uh, to quantify. Uh, we have two examples here. One is uh, the elimination of age-based eligibility criteria for retirement. Uh, so the idea here is, is simply the following. Uh, as you know, was said this, this morning, it's the poorer people who have <coughs> worse health, but most retirement systems come up and say, well, when you get to be 62 or 65 or 78, 78 is a little high, but maybe for me. When you get you know, 68, 70, uh, you can retire. But of course, uh, the, the people transfer to the white uh, Americans by having the same retirement age for both. Retirement age ought to be measured from the expected end of the life, not from the start of the life, is the basic point. Uh, you know, there's various programs that might uh, make, make urbanization more effective, more efficient. We expect these uh, have high benefit cost ratios, uh, but time precludes going into that. Uh, a couple of examples where the benefit cost ratios in terms of the quantity of population are likely to be low uh, is maintaining more of the current model of public pension eligibility uh, at relatively young old ages. They, they didn't used to be so young because life expectancy used to be lower, but they've become young. Uh, and uh, family policies aim at increasing low fertility in high income countries. Uh, for the most part, uh, seem to have low benefit cost ratios. Education, um, as I said before, I think there's awareness and perception that there's great potential in terms of early life, early life stimulation, preschool programs. Uh, once you get to school age, uh, Increased incentives for enrollment of girls who do not enroll in schools at the same level uh, as do boys. Uh, but once children are in school, uh, the girls on average do better than the, as well or better than boys. Uh, you know, there's some issue about how getting the boys to progress. The boys have greater variance, so when you get the higher education levels, there are more uh, males and females. But on average, uh, there's a problem with boys progressing through school. Um, you know, more generally, as populations age, you know, education over the life cycle is going to be more and more important. So looking at understimulation in, in uh, early life, uh, a, a few points that I'll touch on uh, uh, briefly. Uh, Gaps start occurring very early in life, and I'll show you in the next slide an example of this. Um, there's some recent efforts, uh, turning to the third one, to uh, train community women to train mothers to stimulate better their children, which look very promising. Uh, in Columbia, uh, in the uh, British Medical Journal in, I think, September was reported, some results uh, that have an impact of about 0.26 standard deviation, 0.22 in terms of cognitive skills test. I guess uh, an, another example is uh, in, in China, as you well know, there's a huge number of so-called left behind children. Over 60 million children are left behind by their parents who move temporarily perhaps from rural to urban areas for employment. Uh, uh, options. Now that presumably gives the families more income, which might improve the children's learning, uh, but it also uh, deprives the children of interaction uh, with their parents, and we find the latter effect is larger uh, with uh, about a 5% uh, decline in performance. Uh, this is uh, probably 
hard to see, but the uh, basic point is uh, the higher red lines are the um, scores on a vocabulary test uh, for various months from 36 to 72. Uh, the red lines are for uh, children from families' top quartile, the blue in children from uh, the bottom of quartile. Uh, this is a series of Latin American countries, urban, rural areas. Everywhere there's a gap that exists uh, from the start almost, you know, from the start of meaning 36, 40 months of age. Uh, we just don't have data before that. In some cases it seems to increase and these differences persist until you get to school age. Some estimates of benefit to cost ratios for early life stimulation programs based on pretty careful uh, trials and evaluations uh, suggest that home visit programs where along the lines I spoke of uh, in Columbia, uh, there's a home visit by a community uh, worker who uh, helps the mothers to learn better to stimulate uh, her, her children uh, seem to have you know benefit cost ratios on the order of magnitude of three preschool program a little higher pure daycare a little lower these are three percent of course they all go down to six percent but still, these are uh, at least the home visits and the preschool seem like attractive investments. Uh, this is uh, preschool enrollment rates, uh, 1999 for the world 33, uh, 2008 for the world 44. A lot of variation across regions in the world. Latin America, for example, is up to 69. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 17 uh, percent. In uh, Atlanta 2011, we tried to estimate, uh, using data from 73 countries, uh, the impact of moving children from the lower quintiles of the income distribution uh, to enrollment rates like those of children in the higher uh, quintiles. So, you know, a very pro-poor uh, program. Um, there's a systematic relation, it's, it's noisy, but it's systematic, between the pr uh, primary or preschool uh, enrollment rates on one hand and the size of the gap uh, in schooling attainment between the top and the bottom of the distribution on, on the other. And so when we uh, when, uh, increase enrollment rates, our focus is increasing them by increasing them for children from the poorer part of the distribution. Uh, that reduces this gap and uh, arguably uh, results in gains. And uh, we, these estimates uh, suggest that uh, uh, using the policies to increase preschool enrollment at the lower end of the distribution could have, again, by my judgment, very high benefit cost ratios, uh, 6 to 17, with the variation depending on some of the assumptions that are made. Uh, health and nutrition, uh, we've had some discussion about that uh, yesterday and today. Uh, a lot of the focus is on micronutrients. Uh, I think for certain populations that are not trivial in size, South Asia uh, in particular, there are macronutrient uh, 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 issues as well, so I think that's a, a big question. Uh, there's also a problem that I said before, you know, the population is aging everywhere, but it's not aging healthily everywhere. And in many societies, particularly many poor societies, people who are, you know, two-thirds of my age are, suffer chronic disabilities, many people. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, policies that uh, enhance healthy aging uh, have uh, benefit more attention to the chronic diseases. Uh, we talk some about uh, health systems and how you might uh, reorient them to reflect the changing composition of diseases. Uh, social safety nets 
as part of the Protection Against Poverty are part of this overall uh, concern. So uh, again, i be a little selective because of time. Uh, on undernutrition, or malnutrition, uh, is primarily undernutrition, although obesity is increasing a lot, as knows. There's a lot of variation across various countries. Um, Let me not summarize the other, except I will come back to looking at evidence of the long run effects uh, here. So here's the percentage of under five suffering from stunting. Stunting is you know, two standard deviations below the median for a well-nourished population. Uh, and you can see uh, a lot of variation across uh, various world regions. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, almost 40%. South Asia, uh, at this time, 2006, uh, 2010, over 45%. In a well-nourished population, this would be 2.5%. Uh, less problems in other uh, developing countries. For an individual child, on average, in these malnourished uh, populations, you know, the problem starts usually at birth, low birth weight often, in India, you know, 22% or some such percent start at low birth, but it typically deteriorates uh, until, uh, oh, somewhere around two years, two to three years, uh, particularly once uh, foods other than breast milk are entered into the diet because usually that results in use of uh, Water or other contaminated uh, material results in infectious diseases, et cetera. So this is you know, what we would like to get around, what we'd like to avoid. Um, so I'm going to go very quickly. I'm down to two minutes, so I'm going to spend the first 30 seconds going through s seven slides or something. Each slide is this form. In Guatemala, there was a nutritional intervention in 69 to 77. We followed those children uh, up to the 21st century. They're now uh, in their 40s and 50s. So we can look at the impact of reducing uh, st uh, stunting or increasing high for AZ squares uh, over the life of these uh, children, then children. And here, for education-related outcomes, there's a number of outcomes. Uh, for example, uh, one more unit of uh, height for AZ score increases schooling for about a year. Moving a child from stunning to uh, non-stunning to stunning uh, reduces schooling in about 3.9 years. OK. There's lots of outcomes here affected. That's all you have to know because of time, including, though, uh, at the end, uh, increasing the probability that uh, household leaves them poor by about 0.33 if a child is stunted, uh, for example. Okay, I, as my last uh, minute, I'm going to present benefit cost estimates reducing stunting in heavily burdened countries. We have these benefits over the life cycle. I just summarized a whole bunch of them for one particular case. Uh, and we try to make conservative assumptions about what those benefits are. Uh, we look at the uh, cost uh, in various societies. Here's a summary of the cost. First, notice the costs vary a lot uh, across societies. Uh, and then we come up with uh, estimates, benefit to cost in selected high burden countries uh, of reducing stunning, and we use an instrumental variable econometric procedure to try to take care of the estimation issues. Uh, the basic point, again, is that most of these are above 10. The Democratic uh, Republic, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Democratic Republic of the Congo is uh, 3.8, pretty darn good. All the rest are a, a lot better, uh, showing uh, substantially very large gains. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>